All right, everyone, welcome to this episode of The Agronomists. I am your host, Lindsay Smith, and what I hope you are seeing is my face and soon our guests. Uh, we are having some technical difficulties tonight, um, and uh, I can't see anyone. My guests can't see each other, and we can't see the slides. But you know what? As long as our audience can see us, that's what matters. And producer Kara is here tonight. So producer Jay is off. Uh, producer Kara is here. She's running the show behind the scenes. Um, we joke that normally it's um, Lindsay who breaks things at Real Agriculture. Today, Kara broke things. And uh, we're just going to roll with it. It's going to be fine. She's giving me the mad face. Anyway, um, big welcome to everyone, of course, in the comments. Great to see so many people on uh, already. Sorry, we're a few minutes late. Uh, we were trying to get things up and running for you. And um, my uh, my sincerest condolences to everyone battling snow, uh, but uh, Warren, I see you're on in the comments. We are supposed to get ours at about uh, uh, five in the morning. They're calling for five to ten centimeters. Um, I know that uh, we don't really want it. We don't really need the moisture, but certainly on the prairies, uh, you did. But Jason, vote. I see you're here. I, I sort of feel like maybe even Manitoba's sick of the snow at this point. So um, we probably will have um, a few comments about uh, any nitrogen that went on recently tonight um, and what happens with snow and is it bad? Is it good? We'll see. Um, all right. And oh my goodness. So Canadian cowman, Kevin says on his, on his Facebook memories, uh, bailed first cut six years ago today, but right now is two to three weeks out. So mm. holy smokes, I can't even imagine bailing first cut uh, today, but uh, he's in BC. So that's a whole other world. Okay. Um, Quickly, we'll do some housekeeping and then we'll get to today's show. It's going to be a good one. Um, okay, so of course, very, uh, very quickly, head on over to The Agronomist um, on realagriculture.com slash agronomist tomorrow morning. Get your CEU credits for following along with tonight's show, um, as always. And uh, we do, of course, have our show sponsors. So a big thanks to Adama Canada, to Real Ag Radio, and to Mind Your Farm Business. Uh, the Mind Your Farm Business podcast, there was actually a brand brand new episode that went up today. Um, so thank you to our show sponsors for making all the magic happen as well. Um, and without further ado, let's get down to it. This is going to be a huge topic uh, this year and probably for many years for com to come, but this year especially, uh, we are talking nitrogen uh, management and very specifically, we are talking nitrogen or fer nitrogen fertilizer enhancement products, so efficiency products, and we're going to try and navigate. Um, Warren, it is probably my internet that is laggy. Maybe it's yours. At this point, I'm just amazed we're rolling. So, <laughs> so I think we're good. All right. Okay. So I will bring in my guests. Nobody's here to see me. They're here to see my guests. So uh, from Manitoba Agriculture, we've got John Hurd uh, from here at Real Agriculture, my coworker, uh, Peter Wheat, Pete Johnson, as some of you may know, and of course, Dr. Tom Brulsma, which I'm really hoping I got that right, but I don't know if I did. So imagine, gentlemen, Perfect, that you can you. see my face and you can see each other and welcome here to the show. Producer Kara says they look Merry all Christmas. great. <laughs> okay, <laughs> Merry Christmas, yes. Merry Christmas. So, producer, Bless so that you. is maybe a bit of a difference tonight. We'll probably hear Kara's voice more than we usually hear producer Jay, uh, just because we're kind of flying blind here. So, thank you, Kara. I do appreciate it. All right. I will start very quickly. Pete, is it snowing where you are? It actually has snowed. Man, it was a, a virtual blizzard for a little while this afternoon. It was fiercely windy here today. And dang, I, I think we have probably at least four or maybe five inches of snow and they just managed to finish putting the first nitrogen application on my own wheat crop as the snow started mm -hmm. so we have a little bit of nitrogen underneath the snow now and uh, i'll be anxious to hear what tom and and john say about whether that was the right choice or not as we move along yeah okay that's one of my questions for tonight as well all right Tom, is it snowing where you are? My wife just posted a uh, video for the kids. Um, they're, they all live far away. And she's throwing snowballs for the dog in the backyard. Yeah, we've got about, uh, the last time I checked, there was at least uh, a couple inches, and it still seems to be coming down pretty well. 
All right. And yeah, and, and uh, interesting John, to hear I about. I don't want to ask. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead, Tom. Oh, yeah. Oh, I, I was just going to comment on uh, on Peter's uh, broadcast nitrogen on the wheat. Oh, I, hopefully, we don't get five six inches. Uh, you know, if if it melts and generates runoff, that's not so good for the water. But I think that the, the soil wouldn't have been frozen, so um, it should not mo be moving downwards, and that's a good thing. Absolutely. It All right, John. Well, let no, us know I, I uh, just... how many feet of snow you're under. Uh, well, but uh, in our yard, we are about a foot and a half of sloppy, wet Ontario type snow, uh, not the fluffy stuff that we're accustomed to out here. And uh, uh, but in the fields, it's less than that. You know, we rarely get snow without wind and Mother Nature does a good job of spreading it around. Uh, so it, it's still going to be variable. Uh, but uh, right now, no one's really feeding into May, and a lot of the agronomists on the line here are going to be asked to pull, let's see, option number two or option number three out of their back pocket at some point on how are we going to expedite planting uh, if things get slow. Mm -hmm. Yeah, John, Absolutely. don't go with your own. We're certainly hearing. Uh, I have a note for, for Peter oh, there. Johnson, we are. Seated. We're already hearing it. Because <laughs> oats? You're, you're, Did you, you say need John? to have your oats snowed on at least twice to get heavy oats. <laughs> oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, hopefully you I have your oats canola. in the ground. I thought, I thought the best canola. Uh, yeah. I thought the best canola <laughs> saw mm -hmm. snow. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. All right. Um, all right. Let's, uh, we're going to navigate as best we can here. Now, I, I want to sort of start with the basics. So we are talking, yes, nitrogen fertilizer, but most importantly, we're talking about managing losses and products we can use that can potentially um, help to reduce some of those losses. And I, I don't know about the three of you, but I know we certainly field a, a lot of calls, a lot of questions about these products. Um, as well as just losses in general and managing losses in general. So this is my my call out to the comments. Give us your toughest head scratcher. Give us your um, questions for this specific year of what you're thinking about doing. Uh, these experts are here to answer your questions about them. Um, but to get going, I think one of the things we definitely need to do is we need to talk about first, we need the groundwork of how do we lose nitrogen and then where those products fit to manage some of that. So we do have a couple slides. Um, so Kara, if you can pull those up. Tom, do you want to maybe start us off or on on what we're looking at here and and walk us through how we lose nitrogen? So we're on slide one right now. I know you guys can't see it, but uh, we're on slide one. So if you guys want to talk about that one. <coughs> Excellent. Well. Slide one's a great one. Uh, this is a slide Peter put together. So I wasn't quite prepared to be the lead guy on it, but at the same time, <clears throat> I can get started. And as soon as I get too academic, I know P uh, Johnson will cut me off and uh, get more practical. Mm -hmm. But I think when we're looking at nitrogen, um, we're often looking at what we add to the field. We're adding um, fertilizer and it's often in this form we call urea or a few other forms that, you know, you may be using anhydrous or something like that, or UAN, uh, urea with ammonium nitrate in it. And a lot of it is in the ammonium form. So you see that um, being put onto the soil, comes from the fertilizer plant. It goes uh, into the soil as NH4 plus. That's the nature of the ion as dissolved in water. It uh, loves the soil, binds to the cation exchange sites, but it's subject in most soils <clears throat> to being nitrified, converted to nitrate. So, jo so and it's Tom, in that Tom, I'm going to yes. Tom, can I jump in? Yeah. So the yeah. first slide, uh, I, I will, I will maybe take the lead here for just a minute. The first slide is merely to say, man, it's complicated. And if you want to take a screenshot and look at this <laughs> after the fact, I think that's great. And so Kara, if you could move to slide two. 
We're on and so slide, slide two has slide the circles two. around them there. Yep. So now you can start to get a sense <clears throat> of what's important Circle. and what's not important exactly. The circles give some better indication. And again, I don't want to spend long here because we I want questions. To, we want to answer answer your questions, but you can see we can lose nitrogen many ways, whether it's through the tile or surface runoff or, or denitrification or leaching. Like there's all these different things. But at the end of the day, it's complicated. And these are sort of the things that play as we move along. But realistically, if we move to slide three, this is where we start to get into a little bit more of, of trying to make sure that everybody understands the very, very basics of nitrogen in the soil. And so on slide three, mm. you can see we have urea. Urea is fairly stable. We're not too worried about it. In the soil, it changes to ammonia. Ammonia is like anhydrous ammonia. You know that if you don't seal up the slot with anhydrous ammonia, you're going to lose that. So if the urea is on the surface, we're going to lose that. We'll show you that a minute in a minute. But essentially, it's this process. The urea is NH2. You add a hydrogen ion. It's not that simple, but this just makes it as simple as it can be. You get ammonia. You add another hydrogen ion. You get ammonium. And then the whole process kind of falls apart or, or goes in a different direction and loses all those hydrogen ions. And that's what affects, is P, affects pH. But then we end up with nitrate. And so the plant can really pick up ammonium and nitrate the best. So those two forms on the right are what the plant wants. But typically, we're either putting on urea or ammonia, depending on which source. Or we can put on ammonium nitrate, as in 28%. So if you go to slide four then, Kara, and slide okay, four wait, is Pete, just... The, the, hang on, Pete, the host is yep. putting up her hand. Um, so just pause for a minute, because I know we're, we're trying to cover a lot of ground in a short amount of time. But as nitrogen moves through those forms, does it become more prone to loss or is it not that simple? So if we go to slide four, that, that's where we can understand that better. Okay, Lindsay? Perfect. Slide four is Thank up you. on the screen, Pete. So now you can see that the ammonia is what we lose to volatilization. So if that urea is left on the surface and it gets the urease enzyme transforms it to ammonia, then it blows off as ammonia and we lose that into the atmosphere. Now remember, or actually maybe not remember, but just so that everyone is clear, ammonia is not a greenhouse gas. It, it isn't considered a greenhouse gas, but it does contribute to smog. So it isn't a good thing from economically to blow it off. It's also a uh, not a good thing from the air quality to blow it off, but it is not in terms of this 30% reduction that the government is, is hoping we can get to, that we need to get to, to mitigate the, the impacts of climate change. The ammonia is not the, the factor. Ammonium is stable. Nitrate then in the soil can be either leached. If we get too much water and you have a sandy soil, you can get leaching. That's mostly a problem over the winter in, in most soils, it, unless you're really sandy soil, leaching from the 1st of May on is generally not a big loss, but denitrification, we get on those heavy clay soils and it's, the, it's actually the, the leaching can be a problem for water quality if we're pulling that groundwater out and drinking it, but it's gotta be fairly high concentrations. It's a fairly minimal thing. Denitrification, that's the big greenhouse gas. And so those are the losses that we'd really like to stop if we can. And this is, this is the simplest way that I can, I can try to show it to the people. And hopefully, Lindsay, that answers your question. Does it become more subject to loss or less subject to loss? Well, if, if the ammonia is buried, if, if that urea is buried in the soil far enough, then it transforms to ammonia, but the ammonia is captured and trapped in the soil. So it's sort of my anhydrous applicator with an open slot, we know that it blows off and it burns the corn plant. If we get that cl slot closed and sealed, then we trap the ammonia in the soil and I don't have that volatilization loss. 
Ammonium is stable. The nitrate is reasonably stable as long as we don't get excess moisture. So this nitrate right. component really is a, a moisture component. And from there, I'll maybe stop and, and I don't know whether Tom wants to take it from there or, or John. Uh, there's, you know, there's more to this story, but, but it, I wanted to at least get to this point and see, make sure that everybody was sort of on that same page. So if I can, John, if I can go to you just quickly, mm -hmm. um, talking about losses. So your Manitoba, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about, you know, the Manitoba experience. Are leaching losses, um, Pete sort of mentioned they're more fall kind of winter losses. Does that hold true for Manitoba or when is Manitoba nitrogen most uh, prone to losses? We, we think most of our losses, as uh, Peter mentioned, is denitrification. But certainly, if you're on sandy soils, they can be prone to leaching. Uh, interesting, I've already had this question a couple times about people that uh, banded fall ammonia here, who said, there's water sitting in my fields. Am I losing that ammonia? If it still is ammonia form, no, it isn't because it's that ammonium is held in the soil particles. If, however, that ammonia was applied before Thanksgiving and those warm soils converted it to nitrate, well, could be goodbye nitrogen if that is leaking out. But uh, prairie farmers know that the way you manage fall nitrogen is with late application to cold soils. And so that's, that's the, 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 the number one nitrification inhibitor is cold soil. But uh, I appreciate that Pete walks us through this. Knowing this chemistry helps people to know which of the losses uh, is at that risk with their soil type and this type of thing. Mm -hmm. uh, I should say our biggest concern are wet soils in the spring. Uh, then they're subject to both leaching uh, before we have water use by the crop, but primarily this denitrification. And here we use the thumb rule, uh, two to four pounds of nitrogen per acre per day. Once soil is warmed up to five degrees C, uh, we can hemorrhage nitrogen loss in, in those amounts when the water is wow. waterlogged or ponded. Okay, that's, that's, right now, that I don't even want to know what the dollar figure is. Um, and never, and that's, of course, in addition to the environmental impacts. Okay, Tom, um, so that is our, so Pete sort of got us through this chemistry part. Good Can thing, you walk because us... at the pace I was going, you know, I'd still be explaining ammonium, I'm sure. <laughs> but uh, that's, I agree completely. We've got the major losses here. You know, there's a big risk. Mm -hmm. If you leave uh, urea on the surface, you're going to lose a lot of ammonia. And if you are, if it carries on to, into the nitrate form and you get wet soils, you know, in the heavy soils, it's going to be denitrification. In the sandier soils, it's going to be le leaching. So those are some of the key uh, control points that we need to be looking at. And we'll, I'm sure we're moving towards what we can do about them as we go along. Right. So, so because Tom, where uh, there's, oh, go ahead, Pete. No, I just wanted Tom, like John mentioned, soil temperatures of five degrees Celsius and assuming that you could lose two to two to four pounds of nitrogen if the soil is saturated, I assume, John. I was just going to see if Tom could kind of walk us through a little bit how temperature impacts those reactions. Uh, you know, if it's two to four pounds at five degrees centigrade, what what is it at 15 degrees Celsius or or 25 degrees Celsius? Can you give us that sense, Tom, how how that that changes? Yeah, I, it's it's hard to give hard and fast numbers, but you can lose very large quantities by denitrification if the soil is both flooded and warm and there's a lot of nitrate present. You can sometimes lose all of the nitrate that's there in the nitrate form. Uh, but yeah, uh, while it's cold, uh, it's going to be a, a much lower rate. Um, rates mm. of those kind of things in soil tend to increase more or less exponentially. So um, the, the warmer the temperature, 
the faster the rate uh, in general. I, I yeah, should I think... um, one comment on the volatilization. Some of these reactions have been shown to take place in substantial losses, even right down to almost zero degrees. Uh, work in Montana by um, Rick Engel is, is an example there. But but typically we would expect that th so, those losses so... speed up with temperature. Mm -hmm. That's correct. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh I have a little thumb okay. rule for you so that you can now, hang on to, Peter. Oh. Uh, Peter, uh, biological ahead. activities double every time you see. So if you take a five degree loss number, take it to 15, then those losses double. And that's what happens. Every time you go up 10 degrees C, uh, uh, biological activity in general doubles and so those losses would double yeah each so time. so double yeah. double every every 10 degrees celsius and and john you said two to four pounds but would that be a percentage or is that actually just a, a flat two to four pounds i i don't know how i can make that more of a round number for you than two to four uh i could average it to say three for you uh, so no but it's like uh, like it doesn't depend on how much <laughs> nitrate is in the soil john <laughs> you're being a smart aleck again <laughs> i i love it i mean his numbers hold uh, up pete uh, it is uh, the average i, I, I don't know uh we, we're just very fortunate that we had one of uh, and, and again when we say these things it's because our knowledge is built on the shoulders of these scientists that uh, predominated the universities uh, 20, 30, 40 years ago that did a lot of this basic research. Uh, the fellow in Manitoba was uh, Dr. Cho, and uh, uh, he's one of the ones that basically came up with that type of a loss value. But we, we do look back, there are a lot of really influential scientists that did a lot of uh, you know, 50 years ago, and uh, that's what gives us what, what we're working on now. All right, so there are some not very nice comments coming in about uh, my antique sewing machine in the back um, that apparently Kimberton is a few decades behind. And so, yes, that's what I use quite often um, in my day job to hem pants. Anyway, um, I, I think it works. I don't know, John, but we do have a really great, great question that's come in. And I want to take this conversation um, in two directions tonight. One is, of course, products, but the other, and John has sort of alluded to it, is practices we can use that essentially act as like a a product itself right so if we can institute some of the for our management practices are they as good as sort of using a product if we can make that sort of analogy um, and bring those two things together so here is a question now this is bc so when you talk about warm soil so this is a canadian cowman asks with ground to be planted to corn um, they get a manure application, it's mobore plowed in, I know, cover your ears, Pete, immediately to minimize the losses. Now, this is dairy manure. Is there a product to add to the dairy slurry to help reduce losses wide to grassland? Who wants to take that? And Peter, just cover your ears about the plowing part. So if nobody else is going to jump in, I, I will I will jump in. Tom, if you want to, you know, certainly do jump in. But but it's a, actually the the manure manager webcast had a really great session on that exact <coughs> topic. And so the the products that you would add to manure typically are the exact same products that we would add to commercial fertilizer, twenty eight percent. So some of those same nitrogen stabilizers and the reason is that the the nitrogen you're going to lose in the manure is in the exact same form as the nitrogen we lose from commercial fertilizer and so whether it's the nbpt or the dcd or any of those products and if you want lindsay we can go to the some more slides and quickly walk through those products as well but i, mm -hmm. I guess my my other question might be, and whether whether Tom or John can answer this, because I think it's further to, to Kevin's question. We often hear about adding 
you know, some of these carbon-based products to manure. And those carbon-based products will kill the ammonia smell in that manure sometimes. Do those carbon-based products actually prevent nitrogen loss from that manure? Are they nitrogen loss stabilizers? Or did they just tie up the free ammonia enough that we don't smell it anymore? Uh, can you give us a little insight into some of those uh, uh, more, I, I guess we'd call them more biological products or or. I don't know what other term to put on them, but not the not the standard products that we often talk about in terms of nitrogen stabilizers. Peter, I haven't heard of the uh, the carbon products that you would add to manure. Are you talking about um, biochars, perhaps? Perhaps. Well, not so much biochar, but it, but there's many of these activated carbons that that uh, grower <clears throat> growers talk about adding. Uh, John, I, I think you've talked about or, or dealt with them a little bit as well, uh, but they're at very low use rates. So you know we're talking about uh, adding a, a few liters to a to a I don't know a, a two hundred thousand gallon liquid storage tank, and I, I just I know that sometimes they can kill the ammonia smell but do they actually stabilize the nitrogen and and i mean i i don't know the answer that's why i'm asking the question well well you certainly never heard it from me that sounds a little to me uh i i i would say let's stick with some proven chemistry uh like i think you were alluding to originally about using products like uh with nbpt or something like this uh, that's the problem right now everybody is cooking up something in the backyard they claim to be an inhibitor or whatever. And uh, I think we got to go back to no work. And if you don't have the research to show that it works, you know, go pedal it to someone else. So, so let's, but, let's talk products for a second though, because there are, there are, as we went over, as we review, there's, there are several ways we lose nitrogen but there are two main ways we try to reduce the losses so one is to reduce the volatilization and the other is to reduce the denitrification and am i correct that there there's basically products that target one of those losses is that how they break down because we're about to get into a whole bunch of acronyms so let's set the that's stage quite, shall we that's quite right lindsay there's you know there's urease inhibitors mm. uh, that prevent loss of ammonia and there are nitrification inhibitors that prevent the denitrification and pre prevent the nitrate form from forming in the first place. I think that the question was uh, in reference to manure that was being plowed down with a mold or plow. So I think that plowing down, you know, as questionable a practice as that may be, it has taken care of your ammonia problem. You've buried it into the soil. And if the soil has any cation exchange capacity whatsoever, it's probably going to trap most of that ammonia as it comes off the manure. Uh, what will happen in the longer term, though, is you've moldboard plowed, your soil is going to be bare for a while before a crop takes over, and there will be nitrification going on and nitrate the, that could be susceptible to leaching. So then you might put on a product like DCD, uh, a nitrification inhibitor, and uh, that is used in some... Um, some situations, um, but at the same time, there it, it will depend on the end use as well. If you're looking at, a, if you're a dairy farm, um, pastures in New Zealand and uh, Ireland, DCD has been used successfully in manure to uh, to help manage the nitrogen and the losses there. But at the same time, it ended up showing up in the milk from grazing cows on the pasture, oh, and so I believe it's it, it's not used anymore. Okay, so. so so we've got some, hang on, Peter, we've got some pretty specific instances that uh, we've got coming up in the comments. So do you want to get your word in or can I go to questions? Well, I, I just wonder if we should quickly run through slides five to 10, just so that everyone is on the same page. It's entirely up to you, Lindsay. We can just go to the questions, but uh, slides five to 10 for three minutes, I could maybe make sure that everyone understands what products affect which loss. Okay, sure. So, mm -hmm. yep, we've got some good questions coming in and, and we'll use this time then as we run through um, laying out, we've got some good graphics that show you how losses happen and where you can sort of stop them. Um, 
uh, thank you to everyone. We've got four or five good questions already coming in. This is your chance. Give us your real world scenario, your questions, what you're what you're thinking about, how you're going to manage risk this this uh, year and into the fall. So, all right. So, Pete, you said you want to start at slide five. Kara, can, are we there? Are we on slide five? Pardon me. Slide five is up and ready to go. Yeah. Okay, okay. So great. So slide slide five is is just it starts to say we dump the urea into or onto the so soil. And these slides are courtesy of Dr. Craig Dury. So thanks very much for these. But what you really see is when you dump that in, then we get all these different potential losses. So Kara, if you go to slide six, it really kind of shows you where the denitrification and the volatilization and the leaching, where those shake out in terms of the losses as we move across that spectrum. And the more we lose, the less goes to that little corn plant on the right-hand side. So then if you move to slide seven, so really what we want to do with slide seven is we want to stop volatilization. If we have a volatilization product, we're going to slow down that volatilization. So in the bottom right corner, you can see that we've, we've basically put a a tap, we've stopped the volatilization. Now, one of the things you'll notice if you compare it to the smaller graph in the top left-hand corner is that all of a sudden when we stop that volatilization, sometimes we can actually increase the amount of losses of some of the other components, not always, but sometimes. So it's just something to keep in mind. But then Kara, if you go to slide eight, slide eight, gives us the products that, that we know that are scientifically tested and have good research behind them, that these are the products that work. And so in the, the standard one certainly is the NBPT. That's, that's going way back. The new kit on the block is Duramide, and, and that is a product coming from Coke, uh, and it's in Anvol. But all the other products out there pretty much are NBPT. There's a few others, but these are the main ones that are really kind of stopping that vol volatilization loss. So we leave that urea on the surface and we get those conditions that John talked about, you know, where we're starting to lose that nitrogen on the soil surface. It's damp. We're getting those little showers. Those are the products that we'd want to have applied to, to the urea. If we go to slide nine, now you can see we've not only stopped that volatilization loss, but we've also put on products to stop the loss of the other products and so or the other things we're going to lose. And, and that's really where we'd like to be if we're in a loss situation. And so then if you just go to slide 10, and I'm, I'm going through these fairly quickly, but we're going to run out of time. And so now you can see that the products that really stop that that process uh, in terms of moving that ammonium into the nitrate form where it can gas off as nitrous oxide or leach as nitrate, our DCD, nitropyrin, and pronitrodine. And so those are the main products that you want to look at. And there's a wide range of concentrations in different products that you would apply to urea. And I think that's one of those things we probably need to chat a little bit about as well. But hopefully this gives people an understanding that yes, there's two forms of loss. And so we either stop that volatilization with the NBPT and the duramide, or we stop the potential for leaching and also for nitrous oxide loss with the DCD, the nitropyrin, and the pronitrodine. No, pro and with that, I'll shut up and let somebody else take over. You to start asking good questions. <laughs> All right. Okay. No, we appreciate it, Pete. It, it is, as you said, it's a quick run through. Uh, we're not going to be able to dig into all of this tonight, but um, I think that is, it gives us, it, I think it helps us get our head around that, you know, there's two main ways um, that we lose nitrogen. There's essentially two different families of products. Uh, I think the overarching message here is understand your greatest risk of loss and recognize that um, things might have a different trade name, but they might be a similar 
um, product and that we need to make sure that we've got some science behind them to back it up. So with that, let's move into some of these scenarios, which is exactly what I was hoping would come in. And of course, as always, fantastic audience, everyone is delivering. So Warren Schneckenberger out in Eastern Ontario says, if I use a nitrification inhibitor with my Y drops and it rains, did I waste my money? What if it only rains a few millimeters? So walk us through that scenario. Tom, do you want to take that? John, Pete, who wants sure, it? Sure, I'll, uh, I'll take a crack at it. All um, right, Tom, go ahead. You, you applied a nitrification inhibitor. With, presumably yeah. it's with your UAN um, and uh, you've got some rain afterwards. Well, you if you only use the nitrification inhibitor, I think you've got a good scenario because you've washed your fertilizer into the soil a little bit, preventing the risk of, or lowering the risk of loss of the ammonia form because you didn't use, what I'm hearing is you only used a nitrification inhibitor, not a urease inhibitor, which would have prevented ammonia loss. So uh, is it of any value? It's down in the soil. Well, it may be preventing and delaying the conversion to nitrate so you may be reducing some of the emissions of the, some of the nitrogen oxides there, NO or N2O that you see. Um, so you've possibly done a very good thing for reducing your greenhouse gas emission. You also have preserved it in an ammonium form, so it's less susceptible to leaching and perhaps denitrification if you get a, a really um, uh, wet uh, event afterwards that kind of floods the soil because those are the conditions that favor denitrification. So I would say, no, you haven't wasted your money. Okay. Uh, I would say you have. Uh, I would say that's a uh, uh, nice way to say that is that you've been misinformed because if you're wide dropping nitrogen in corn, I don't want that to be delayed in uptake. I want that to be immediately converted for uptake. Uh, remember but what Peter John, said, leaching don't happen. Leaching don't happen in the summer. Uh, this is a oh, nitrification yeah, yeah. inhibitor, John. It, 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 it's not well, preventing uh, anything from being available. Uh, well, it's going to slow down the ammonium portion from converting through to nitrate. And yeah. uh, again, that's going to take up either one. In the nitrate form as soon as possible. Yeah. So uh, I, uh, out here, that would be misguided. Maybe that's good advice for Eastern Ontario, but out here, uh, we'd say uh, strike one. Ooh. And so I'll just, I love it. I'll just. This I'll is, jump in for a minute, ahead, Lindsay, and just, just say that, sure. you know, in that in that time of year, in order to get loss from denitrification, the soil has to stay saturated. And the corn crop, if it's growing well, is taking up between a quarter and a third of an inch of water per day per acre. Mm -hmm. So you, you really need a lot of water before you would ever saturate that soil enough to get that nitrogen to denitrify. And if you did, and occasionally we do, it's very rare, but occasionally we do. I think it was 2015, we got six inches of rain in the first two weeks of June or something like that. And we did see denitrification losses. But for the other 20 years out of that, that time frame, we just didn't get enough moisture. So mm -hmm. could, it, could it have a benefit? The answer is yes, but I think the reality is that the risk of that loss, given how much water the corn crop is using, is really small. And in Western Canada, where John is, it's even smaller because they get less rainfall than we do in Ontario. And so I think that's where we get the divergence. Okay. Well, moving uh, on. I'll go one step oh, further. Sorry. We, we, uh, go oh, ahead. No, no, I got to kick, kick at this one again. Uh, people invest in protecting the nitrogen in different ways. One way is to spend money on these inhibitors. Another way is to do applications. So I'd say uh, this farmer has already done his nitrogen management due diligence. He's protected against those early season nitrogen losses. He's withheld nitrogen until it's time to feed and, and then goes. And so, uh, I call that double or triple inhibiting if it's going to be uh, uh, extra protecting things. Uh, I, I, I think that uh, you know, we have that out here with people. They spend their money on iron and equipment in order to protect their nitrogen and apply it 
efficiently. And often that means you don't need the extra if you've already made a good time and placement investment. I'll, I'll pass. I think John, and that makes a very, a very large um, greenhouse gas mm -hmm. footprint associated with your uh, uh, fertilizer use. That is economically not necessarily going to hurt any farmer. It's not going to hurt your profits. But at the same time, if we want to meet a reduction goal, uh, we, we have to avoid events like that. And therefore, a nitrification inhibitor, I would tend to be using it more often, perhaps, <laughs> than, than most agronomic agronomists who are making recommendations for the economic benefit of a farmer. Mm -hmm. Now, Lindsay just happened to get kicked off. I don't know if something happened with your in with her internet. This is producer Kara here again. Um, so, Pete, I don't I don't know if you want to take over. I sure. know you always have a couple questions here on the go. Yeah, absolutely. And so I think I think we've gone through that one. And I actually mm. think uh, Kara, if, if we if you could go to slide fourteen, I think John's slide fourteen really shows exactly what the difference is between what John's talking about and what Tom is talking about. So okay. slide 14 like should say summary of field oh. studies at the top of it. You betcha we're up there, Pete. Uh, I, I, could, I could speak to the beginning of that, but I'd invite Tom with a, a wider perspective than this. And this is just that uh, Muriel Tenuta that really leads our greenhouse gas uh, and night a nitrogen uh, effort out here in, in Western Canada at the University of Manitoba, uh, summarized this at our recent meetings of his past studies. Uh, so you can look at the next years and look at where is the major impact. And a lot of these agronomic factors, uh, the in, uh, effect on yield is infrequent. In fact, uh, the indiscriminate use of uh, you know, in polymer coated urea or, or nitrogen inhibitors is like indiscriminate use of micronutrients. It's rarely is there a benefit, but targeted, there could be a great benefit. But that aside, the nitrous oxide reduction, cha ching, Justin, we just met your target. So that that is a bit of good news. Uh, shows that there is some opportunity within, you know, using some of these 4R approaches uh, to meet nitrous oxide emission targets. But uh, as Tom said, you know, it's not going to be on the backs of agronomic performance that that comes along. It seems to be uh, uh, occasional agronomic benefits, but solid emission benefits. And Tom, I'd ask you to comment on this because you certainly get to see this from a, a wider area also. Well, thanks, John. Yes, I, I think these data make the point uh, very well. These are Manitoba data. There is similar data for uh, projects uh, for studies that have been done in Ontario. And not only that, um, I had a slide as well. It gets too complex to show everything. But at the same time, there are uh, studies that have summarized uh, with and without nitrification inhibitors with and without polymer coated urea over dozens and dozens of site years in places around the world. And they keep coming up with this figure, some, something on the order of 30% nitrous oxide reduction. Uh, in the, the Agriculture Canada's discussion document that's out there on the greenhouse gas uh, reduction uh, emission, emissions reduction uh, project, uh, they, they they're, they acknowledge 15 to 35 percent nitrous oxide reduction. So it, that is an average, but we got to remember this nitrous oxide is emitted into the atmosphere in a global pool. It's not Canadian nitrous oxide anymore. It's not Manitoba nitrous oxide. It's it belongs to the whole world, and it's out there as a greenhouse gas for the next many many years, uh, and and it's very effective as a greenhouse gas. So if we can reduce it, uh, there's a huge societal benefit to that that the farmer doesn't get profit from unless you're somehow rewarded for reducing those emissions. And for this reason, we need some kind of a mechanism in place so that government can recognize and reward the use of some of these products. 
So now, before you hop in there, Pete, I'm just going to let you know, because uh, I know you can't see, Lindsay is here, and uh, she is back in the host seat. So uh, take her away. I, I don't know. I feel like you guys were doing fine without me. Um, but <laughs> but it sounds like our, our platform just doesn't love us today, but we're just going to keep rolling. Um, so I missed the question. It sounds like we did get into some of the regulatory talk. So that is, of course, the other aspect to this is that we're, we're talking about this not just because it's the right thing to do for the environment, not just because it's the right thing to do for our crop production and our bottom line, but there are potentially, um, or we know that there are some aspirational targets, perhaps some regulatory targets, um, maybe some programs we're going to be able to participate in if we so choose. So this is definitely something we need to know about. Now, when um, I was booted off this program, um, I'm not sure what happened, but when I was booted off, I did lose all the questions. So um, yes, thank you, John. I can't get Starlink till next year. So thank you uh, for rubbing that in. Um, that's great. There was a great question. I see Ryan has asked one here as well, um, but there was a great question. Gord had a question about the impact that residue, surface residue may have on volatilization. So yeah. I, I think we're talking urea, urea applied does um, the the presence or absence of uh, surface residue have an impact on the rate of loss? Do we know? Uh, we don't, we do know, oh. yes. Uh, surface residue is very okay. rich in the urease en enzyme. So um, yeah, it's all the more important to use an inhibitor uh, if, they're, if, if you're broadcasting into a, a surface that's covered with uh, crop residue. Okay. So there you go, Gord. Ryan Benjamins has a has a great question, and this builds off the discussion um, I just hopped in on. Ryan says, "What happens if the corn doesn't use all of the of the nitrogen? If we reduce our N2O for the summer, do we just lose it after harvest, or do we reduce our rate with the use of inhibitors?" So I'll I'll take a run at that one if that's okay, Lindsay. And sure, from it, it really. It depends on where you live. If you're John Hurd or you're Ray Dalbanco in, in Western Canada, then chances are it stays in the soil or at least there's some of it probably stays in the soil because you're so dry that it doesn't get lost over the winter. It doesn't leach out. It probably doesn't denitrify. It could, but that risk is much lower. Ryan, if you're in Ontario and you have leftover nitrogen in September, you know that the vast majority of that is going to either leach, now leaching isn't a greenhouse gas, but it's still an environmental problem, or it's going to denitrify. And that will depend on what's the soil temperature through that, that fall period and early spring. Last fall, wet October, warm October, man, if you had leftover nitrogen in your corn crop, <laughs> chances are it's gone and it's gone as a greenhouse gas. So that's where the, the last part of that question is, do we reduce our rate with the use of inhibitors? And maybe Tom can tell me, but man, when I look at the vast amount of work that's been done, we have not looked at reduced rates with that inhibitor. We've just looked at, you know, did we gain yield when we use the inhibitor? And sometimes the answer is yes, more often it's no. But again, generally speaking, the amount of nitrogen we blow off, except in those unusual circumstances, the amount of loss is really small. It's 1%, it's 2%, it's 3% of the nitrogen. Huge environmental concern, but who cares from an agronomic concern? So the only time you can really reduce your rate would be if you're in a consistent loss scenario, you're on those heavy clays of Lambton County that sit saturated for a long time and you've been putting on 200 pounds of nitrogen on your corn crop. Well, you know, probably there you could reduce it, but if you're on a silt loam at Alora, the chances of that nitrification inhibitor or the stabilized nitrogen, meaning you can use less nitrogen are actually pretty slim. Mm. Okay. Now, yeah. Tom, go ahead. Yes, I, I would. Uh, I think the question is on to something there that, you know, there is the possibility that uh, used in the wrong way, uh, particularly a treatment that delays 
uh, nitrogen release substantially, like a polymer-coated urea, there is some risk that your nitrogen is going to be released too late. There'll be an excess of it there in the fall, and the possibility is you could have nitrous oxide emissions there. I'd point out that, you know, whether it becomes a greenhouse gas nitrous oxide or one of the other forms, N0, or not N0, <laughs> NO, nitric oxide, or N2, those are not greenhouse gases, but they, they're, they're a loss of nitrogen as well. So you, you don't want to, you want to use it in the right way. And this is one of the reasons why the fertilizer industry has been advocating with the federal government to recognize the 4R program. You're using the right source at the right rate, right time, right place, paying attention to all of them and put, putting them together, as Peter was suggesting. So, but the trouble with try using these products to adjust rate is that we have another very large factor that affects the optimum rate to apply. And that's that the fact that the weather varies every year. And every year has a different optimum rate. And yet most of our recommendations give you the same recommendation for the same crop every year. So what we need to do is have, find systems where we're applying later into the season so we get an idea of what the crop's yield potential will be, what the yield, what the loss mechanisms have been. Then we can start talking about fine-tuning rates. Once we've controlled losses, it, it gives you more opportunity to uh, control uh, rates and make sure you're reducing to exactly the optimum and not reducing below optimum where you lose a lot of yield. Mm -hmm. yeah. Now, we've had a couple comments come in about um, using potentially oh, some John, cover crops. Sorry, John's after. got his hand up there, Lindsay. John, oh, okay. I was actually going to go to John next. So, uh, yeah. So, John, you weigh okay. in and then I have a question for you. Oh, okay. I'll just weigh in is that uh, well, what, what has become offensive to me is, as uh, so I was talking to a dealer this morning who said he was working with a farmer and, he, and who said, well, I'll just broadcast on a whole bunch of nitrogen before seeding. And if I take off losses, I'll just put on an extra 10%. I think those days are over. So if people are thinking that uh, rather than using an inhibitor, something appropriate, such as uh, these products, by just bumping it up with increased rates, uh, I call that a a non 4 r practice, I call that a bad 4 r practice, that adjusting rates to account for losses, the, the, those days should be behind us now that we do have effective practices. Okay, I'm done with that. Next question. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Okay. So we've got some we've got some great discussion on the cover crop um, scenario that we will delve into in a moment. But John, I did want to cover because one of the comments that I did see before um, I lost all the comments for, was from Dr. Dave Hooker, sort of outlining, you know, what is the best fit for some of these. So let's talk Manitoba specifically. Um, so in this in the scenario and with the farmers you work with, John. What are what are some of the the best fits for some of these products um, uh, there? Well, funny you should ask. The survey says, and and both Tom and I participate in uh, getting to review some of these survey results that uh, of uh, prairie corn growers, twenty percent use an enhanced efficiency fertilizer, uh, uh, either ESN or Super U and some enhanced efficiency fertilizer. But uh, if we look at targeted approaches, those going after seeding, as in some type of surface broadcast or whatever, it's 33% are using an enhanced efficiency product like NPPT or urease inhibitor. So I would say that's a good example of farmers recognizing at-risk practices and using appropriate technologies. And uh, there's a, a, a fit, not a lot, but you know, uh, five to 10% uh, and, and a student view in some of their programs. I just trust that if they are using it, it's to address something in their situation that says, I've got nitrogen at risk. It's either going in a wet field I would like it. It's being broadcast rather than banded. So there's something that's putting nitrogen at risk that I'm choosing to use a, 
uh, in, in inhibited uh, aspect to help uh, account for that. So, mm -hmm. uh, so I, now I want to mention, okay, go ahead. Well, no, I was just saying, you know, sort of putting it together that as, as you said, so either, you know, so farmers may have already invested in equipment in that sort of technology so that they can yeah. use the right source, right rate, right time, those sorts of things. So using the 4R, but then also incorporating the technology when they've identified where they have a higher risk. Yeah, yeah. And uh, that's the great thing about some of these products. Uh, sometimes even our traditional practices, mother nature may make them a high risk. And if that's the case, then you've got the option sometimes of applying. Uh, we are quite interested. We're doing more studies now with uh, with ammonia. Ammonia generally put on appropriately is kind of a low risk because it goes on late fall on the band. But uh, if those happen to be in wet areas uh, and they go earlier than normal, I would say those are quite legitimate places to, to target the protection. Okay. Now, so two things. We've got, there's a bit of a cover crop discussion I want to get back to, but uh, there is a question here. So Tom, John, uh, uh, yeah, Tom or Pete, I'll put this to you. 28% applied on the surface, not incorporated, prior to no-till corn in Ontario. What do I protect? Volatilization or denitrification or both? So which risk would this particular farmer be targeting to try and manage with a product? So... I'll, I'll jump in and Tom can, can come second. Uh, the, my quick answer is your highest potential loss is volatilization. Now, if you're on a heavy clay so that your soil sits saturated, then I think you also have to look at a denitrification product. But you're putting it on the soil surface. It's a no-till scenario. And I think Jim McComb put in the in the chat and he's a hundred percent right. If you get those little showers, just two millimeters, three millimeters, it just wets that urea up on the soil surface where there's water, it's not incorporating it, and the urease enzyme will just blow a whole bunch of that off. And it's no-till, so you have more residue there. So you already have more urease enzyme there. If I'm on a sandy loam soil or a silt loam soil where it rarely sits saturated, once there's enough rain to move that nitrogen into the soil, the chances of denitrification losses are quite small. Still an environmental concern, but agronomically quite a low percentage. So I would look at soil type to say if I need both, but my first is definitely going to be volatilization product. Tom, I'd I'd support Peter completely on the uh, the first choice, and the first thing you need to manage is that loss of ammonia from urea. A urea uh, granule sitting on the soil surface, you know, that's a high concentration. As it hydrolyzes, as that urease enzyme works on it, uh, it's releasing a high concentration of ammonium. And when you get a high concentration of ammonium, it's not only doing that it's also raising the pH right around that granule. And when you have high pH in a solution, the ammonia just flies out of there. And if it's, if it's still at the surface, it's got nothing to trap it between that and the whole mm -hmm. atmosphere of the earth. So you, that, that ammonia will be gone. So if you can get the, get the product deeper into the soil, the ammonia will get trapped on on soil surfaces but it so that's very important the nitrification inhibitor it's it's again in a, we don't know whether you're going to have a huge loss of nitrate from that product but already by slowing the release of uh, ammonium you're going to slow down the nitrification process and perhaps keep it available um, but keep it there until the corn can start taking it up but that, that could take quite a while and you the other thing is you, if you put your nitrification inhibitor on then you're probably getting this 30 percent reduction effect on the nitrous oxide part and so that's i think where where the greenhouse gas challenge comes in there and where we can somehow uh, start addressing that mm -hmm. the the challenge will be yeah we, in order to get paid for paid back for that uh, nitrous oxide emission that doesn't escape 
uh, a, a fairly complicated program is going to have to be developed and people and farmers will need to share data as well. Uh, because mm -hmm. it, the amount of reduction you get, the amount of, if you, you've contributed to the greenhouse gas reduction depends on the rate of fertilizer you're using. It depends on where you are, your soil texture, uh, where you are in Canada. We have a much higher emission coefficient here in Ontario than any anybody does in Manitoba and the West. Mm -hmm. um, digging into those coefficients is really interesting. Um, not always in a good way if you're in Ontario, as you mentioned, Tom. Um, but it is certainly interesting to look how that works. Now, um, we are running out of time, but um, I did want to quickly touch on this. So in in talking about, you know, if there's leftover nitrogen, let's say after that corn crop comes off, there's some comments here talking about, okay, so then can can you put a cereal cover crop to, to hold some of that in? So to capture it and hold it. Um, another person suggested perhaps radish because radish could scavenge that quickly. Um, but in in these scenarios, if it's if it's an annual, if it's going to to winter kill, I guess the question really becomes, you know, is there value in capturing that N if the plant winter kills and is potentially releasing it in April when there's when there's no crop to take it up? Is it still then? Is it better than nothing? Or do we want something that really we'd have to terminate right ahead of the crop um, to really hold it and, and not have it subject to losses? Who wants to maybe walk through that discussion? So not I'll jump me, in. Because we're really I'll... not a fan. Yeah, yeah right. So... Okay. Okay. <laughs> All right. I'll, I'll real quickly, because we are running out of time. The rye, it will tie up the nitrogen but we don't know when it's going to release. And the research work that we've done here would say, yep, it'll tie it up, but it may never release it for the next crop. And so when it mm -hmm. becomes available is really a big question mark. And I see that some of the other people have commented about radish and that's 100% correct. Radish breaks down so quickly. Yes, it, it ties up tons of nitrogen in the fall, but it dumps it all in March or early April or somewhere in that time frame, And so now I have all this free nitrogen in the soil right when the soil is primed for denitrification losses. So if, the, if it's ahead of a corn crop, it never transfers that, that nitrogen that it tied up to, to the corn crop because it dumps too early. It's actually why red clover works so perfectly ahead of a corn crop because the red clover releases the nitrogen when the corn crop needs it. And so can we tie up nitrogen with cover crops? Yes, we can. But sometimes we don't do any benefit either to the crop we're growing or to the environment. And, and so we really need to target the cover crop based on what we're trying to do with that cover crop. Okay. Um, I'd and agree Kevin, with Peter there. Yep. <clears throat> Kevin says you could silage it in the, in the spring and feed cows. Well, if, if you like it tall that's enough. our solution. That's our solution but, to everything. Let's just cut it for that, feed. That's what you call innovation, and I, I think I, I, I think you can look at that. What I've been impressed by with cover crop data is that you know cover crops that I thought were really nothing, you know, hardly one or two tons per hectare of dry matter total, do make a big difference on the amount of nitrate that's available to leach. And so particularly in areas where you're concerned about, or you're sensitive to getting nitrate into groundwater, uh, just even a small cover crop makes makes that difference between getting 10 part per million in your well and not getting 10 part per million in your well. Uh, so the, I think the, what we have to remember is that nitrate is quite mobile and something growing green in the soil is always a good thing. Um, if it's releasing too fast in the spring, you know, maybe you have to harvest the crop or something, but I, I don't know if that works for the, uh, for the, the radishes. I d doubt if that works at all for the radishes, but, uh, I think cover crops are an important part of the solution. Um, but of course the most, the ones that really improve your soil health and really, really tie up the nitrogen and build soil organic matter are the cover crops that you can grow following winter wheat. Mm -hmm. Oh, goodness. And then, of course, you could be somewhere where a cover crop is perhaps more a user of water than you'd ever want to give up. Right, John? Producer Western yes. Canada, definitely a di <laughs> totally different scenario. Yeah. Yeah. You certainly I have was going to say, <laughs> yeah, Producer Kara is, is based uh, in a part of Alberta that hasn't seen rain in a very, 
very long time. And so she says yes. Yeah, cover crops are a great fit for certain areas, but in others, um, mm -hmm. there isn't enough moisture to get the crop to grow, never mind. A second one. Uh, that's just getting greedy. Right, Producer Kara? That's right. right. Yeah. <laughs> that's right. Can, can, uh, can, all right. Can I, can I now, a shout out there? Yeah, of course. I, can I speak my piece here for a sec? Uh, I just want to put the agronomist on notice that... Uh, one of the things apparent in the survey out here is that farmers sometimes know that they're putting something on to do this with their nitrogen, but invariably in the questions comes back, uh, they're not sure that they know the name. So I look at these things and I, I kind of blame the agronomist for this, that uh, they're bundling things with nitrogen now and not doing a good enough job explaining or being smart enough how to explain to the farmer what protection they're buying and where it should be used. And so we have nitrification inhibitors, urease inhibitors, and dual inhibitors. And I thought the same agronomist would know grass herbicide, broadleaf herbicide, and broad spectrum herbicide. So they would know their herbicides, but maybe they don't know their inhibitors so well. And they need to know that package and mm -hmm. there's something else they need to know in that package, and that is the amount of active ingredient. And that is all over the map. We have established products like Agritain with farmers with known levels of expectation because they know what level of NBPT is in there. It's a crapshoot looking at some of the labels. Some companies don't put on there what the levels are their application rates are lower and we just wouldn't put up with that with pesticides. Uh, I talked to agronomists and several of them say we take that into account. We often take those more generic brands and we'll getting the same level of performance that they would get with an egg retain. So that's just that's just my my riding off in the sunset notice here is that agronomists need to know this stuff. They need to know uh, how to explain what the inhibitors do and to get to the issue. Absolutely. I, I completely agree. And it's part of, you know, one of the reasons why we want to do this show and why I'm sure we'll be following up on this in many other ways and probably in our schools as well is um, it does seem to be, even though these products have been around for quite some time and we've understood sort of some of these losses um, and products and how they work, there there isn't, and I think it was mentioned tonight, you know, using these products doesn't always give a yield bump. And that sometimes is is the crux of this, is that um, sometimes it can be hard to decide, was it really worth it? But we have to recognize that there are other reasons we might need to or have to use these products. Um, but John, you're bang on because it's one of the things in preparing for this episode that I was trying to keep straight in my head is, you know, what the actual sort of active ingredients are, like we think of with our herbicides or our, our pesticide products, um, and keeping it straight as to which ones do what. And I think it's yes, absolutely up to the agronomists that are advising their clients on this to, to do that research. And it's also, of course, in the farmer's best interest to do their research as well so that they can ask the right questions of of the professionals that are advising them. So, John, uh, fantastic advice. Uh, Tom or, or Pete, we're way over time. Any parting thoughts from uh, from either of you? I hardly think that um, you'd be quiet on this one. So, any parting thoughts? Uh, thank you uh, so much, Lindsay, for the invitation to participate here. Um, I probably haven't been as clear as I really wanted to be on some of the points I was making, but, um, you know, uh, I really underscore John's point. We, every agronomist needs to understand these products well. We need more research on some of them, and we need lots more uh, testing on farm as well. We have a, a system in Canada for fertilizer registration where the government no longer tests the efficacy of products that are marketed. They test the safety, they test environmental safety, but they don't test efficacy. And so we need to be doing that on farm uh, more and more uh, to ensure we're moving ahead uh, with um, improving the, the nitrogen use efficiency of Canadian agriculture. Thank you.
Pete, you get the last Lindsay, word. So I'm just going to say that there's a whole bunch of great questions in the chat that we didn't get to. And I apologize for that. If anybody wants the PowerPoint that we put together, we're happy to share it with them. The, the one thing Dave Hooker asked is, you know, what is the worst case scenario? And, and John mentioned split apply nitrogen. That's, that's one of the best management practices you can apply. If you split apply nitrogen, you've reduced your risk. But lots of growers think, oh, I'm going to split apply my nitrogen and I'm going to side dress my corn and knife in that nitrogen, but I'm just running a coulter and spraying it down and I'm not doing anything to close the slot. That is actually the worst case scenario because we mm -hmm. take that nitrogen and we put it two inches in the soil in damp soil, no rainfall to move it deeper and the slot is not closed and now it blows off like crazy. It's warm soil, it's got moisture. And so sometimes some of the things we do or try to do as a best management practice, we're actually shooting ourselves in the foot. So incorporation, yes, but it must be well covered. And then this, beyond that, if it's a surface application, doesn't matter if it's 28% or it's straight urea, because 28% is half urea, then volatilization products are something you really need to consider unless it's going to rain tomorrow. And if we knew that every time, we'd all probably be retired by now. Um, okay, all right. With that, Peter Johnson, thank you so much. Uh, Tom and John as well. And of course, to our show sponsor, Adama Canada. Yes, thank you for your time. Uh, thank you to producer Kara for navigating us through this uh, episode tonight. And to each and every one of you in the comments, I really do appreciate it. And there were so many great questions we didn't get to. So please, if you uh, if you would like, if you have a question you'd really like our panel to answer, uh, you can mm -hmm. email me, lsmith at realagriculture.com. I can get in touch with them and get those answers as well. All right. Uh, thank you, everyone. Um, yeah, just send me an email. I can get you the slides as well. Or, of course, meet Pete. Um, and uh, away we go. All right. Thank you, everyone. We'll see you next week here on The Agronomist. Cheers, everybody. Bye now. Okay.